opening government entered this debate to tell you that history was really important and they wanted everyone to learn it and they wanted all the kids to actively participate in history class and learn the roots of uh, their own roots of identity. But at the same time, they want to remove the they want to remove the individuals that are part of that uh, they are part of that massacre that happened, they are part of the atrocities that happened, and part of the very events that they deem really important. Oftentimes, the people within the stories and history books that exist are the individuals and are the reason why many people read up on these history story, historical texts in the first place, and are the reason why people care about the historical events that happened. The, I have two arguments for you in this debate. The first, why principally you cannot exclude these individuals from history textbooks, and the second on why uh, the second on how individuals are more able to relate past atrocities to current atrocities that happen. But before that, several responses. So, firstly, they tried to tell us that history played a very vital role within uh, within society today, and we need people to learn history. So the first thing we will say is this, uh, it becomes very hard for individuals on the ground not to, uh, to care about history in the first place because the side of opening government's version of history sounds really abstract and really hard to understand for individuals. So this means school children are less likely to be interested in your subject in the first place because there's not, there isn't an identity or a person that they can relate that form of history or that past atrocity to. So this means the events that happen under the side of opening government are uh, like happen in a vacuum and individuals on the ground are, it becomes very hard for them to tie the specific event to an individual that will make them more interested to find out more about that event. But before that, sure. So given that these individuals, A, have just not been around for a long time, also <laughs> in the sectors, why does the how of extractism apply to them as well? Sorry, can you repeat that? <laughs> no, like, okay, so the second thing that I tried to tell us about having more concentration camps. So the, the thing is, a lot of times we like we agree that some information is omitted because of the stop, how short the story plays and how little it contributes to the grand scheme of events and the grander like atrocity that happens. But I think it's far worse under your side of house when you actively try to exclude certain individuals and the emphasis on the individuals that contributed towards your events. So this means that when you exclude like certain people because you believe that some some information is excluded, you in, you exclude even more information at the end of the day. So this means because you don't want to focus so much on the individuals that committed your atrocities, you would also have to omit certain parts of that history or like certain parts of the upbringing of that individual that resulted in like them committing that atrocity in the first place. So on to the first argument, like first argument of like first principle <laughs> argument on why it's important to include these important figures. So firstly, I think it's important to note that these are the individuals that were part of the very history itself. This means Hitler was the central individual that started this whole like Nazi party and he was the individual that spearheaded it. So he contributed the most towards the massacre of the Jews in the first place. And I think there needs to be a significant amount of time spent by history teachers in teaching individual, uh, teaching school children as to why this individual decided to do it and how much uh, a role that this individual played in the grand scheme of the uh, of the, uh, the massacre that happened in the first place. So this means the point at which you don't learn about the individual, people are less likely to be incentivized to learn about like the rest other parts of the history because they can't relate it to a person. So this leads me directly to my second argument in this debate. Here's why it's important for individuals on the ground to be able to relate the past atrocities by people to what's happening now. And this is an outcome to that principle of uh, like learning history as a society. Because here's the nuance about learning about learning about individuals and historical figures in and of itself. We think you, we, when you learn about people and in general, you learn about the human motivations that exist to, that prompted that crime to exist, that prompted, prompted that atrocity to happen in the first place. And this is important because people start to analyze why individuals committed that crime. Is it because of the upbringing of that individual or the background? And this is why the biography of that individual is incredibly important. Because we recognize that like the upbringing of that individual could have affected his his actions when he was in power or when he was in a position of when he was in a position of authority. So this means that we learn the, the like the psychological part of it as to why people committed these atrocities in the first place. And on the second level, here's where we get to analyze the exploitation of power and how it manifests. 
Because the point at which we can see that this individual has a process towards stepping into that point of power and using and exploiting that power to cause certain historical massacres, I think this is when we see like how that power that power that power manifests and we are able to point it out. Why is this important? Because people on the ground can relate past atrocities or past like historical happenings to as to what's happening now. So this means we see the ethnic cleansing of mil of like six million Jews, we're able to relate it and say it's similar to the one that is happening now. The ethnic cleansing of Tibetans and Uyghurs within China and the ethnic cleansing of Rohingyans within Myanmar. I think this is really important because people on the ground are more like more like they have more hatred towards Hitler and what he did to the Jews opposed to the ethnic cleansing that is currently happening inside. So this means the point in which people on the ground are able to say that Hitler is like the people, like the army within Myanmar that oppresses the Rohingyas are similar to that of Hitler's regime. No, thank you. I think it's incredibly important because we're more likely able to garner support for individuals that are currently suffering from abuse of power, especially when we're able to pinpoint it to past historical events and individuals that abuse their power in those past historical yeah. events. Given the current atrocities like are extremely terrible, but don't generate the same magnitude in which past atrocities have, I think it's important for individuals on the ground to be able to relate to that incident and tie it to an individual similar to now to give the incident the same form of intensity and the same form of importance as they did to the old and the previous historical events. Because under the side of opening government, it is a world that will refuse to name Najib or at least say his name actively within his 1MDB scandals. They will only say BN in a bubble and say that this happened in a, uh, like, they'll say the event happened, but they're refusing to tie it down to an individual and spend time explaining why, how that individual came to power and abused it.
Okay. Right. okay. So I think that no one really wants to debate the context of this debate because this is not about history in totality. You can find information about Hitler anywhere. You can find information about Stalin or Napoleon or whatever after your college or university. I think this context is towards children and how we teach the younger generation on what history means. And this debate needs to be on how we can garner the most interest amongst those very children and which way can we get those children actually remembering the kinds of things that they are learning in history class. I understand a lot of the things we're just saying. That's probably true. There's a villain hero complex without telling me why that's really bad. Yeah. But you need to tell me, in your world, why children is going to be more interested in random facts or stories? Because you can't draw a comparative to the Bible. Because those people actually want to read the Bible. Your children don't really have a lot of interest in history. It's your job to make it interesting. And I, I'll be why I'll tell you why explicitly. Because if, if it wasn't clear from Daphne's speech, is that that interest towards children happens when there's some form of human connection towards those very people in history and the kinds of human motivations that they had. Because the thing about children is that they're probably not very knowledgeable, but they can understand and rationalize the things that they're feeling and the things they are seeing on a visual perspective. If they're seeing the way in which Hitler conducted the, the Holocaust, it's very easy for them to understand, but also to remember the kinds of things Hitler did. Maybe it's true that there will not be a lot of information about the societal progression or the social economic situation in Germany at the time. But even if you were to teach children that, you probably won't remember it anyway. So you need to recognize the comparative. Do we prioritize A or go where they can talk about an individual and ground a certain story towards that person? or B, bunch of random facts that you would expect them to memorize. Maybe they're not um, dates, but they're stories and one-liners of stories that they are forced to memorize because it's part of the very grander scheme of that story. Sanjeev, yeah. Sanjeev you're telling me that education shouldn't be something that we learn, but it should be something that's fun and easy to do. So that means we wouldn't teach you maths, we teach you plus and minus because it's easier to learn and better to do. Bro, this debate, you want to change something because you want children to learn history, right? If you think that it shouldn't be fun and you also don't know what, what your case lah. You want more objective teaching. But if your teaching means people don't listen to that very teaching or don't digest that very teaching, then you're defeating your purpose of teaching history in the first place. Because I think the meaning of ped pedagogy, pedagogy or whatever that means, is teaching those very children of that history or the kinds of things that happened in the past. I think it's more important than teaching basis of facts, but it's about the things like Daphne said, how people hold positions of power, why it's easy for you to equate the kinds of things Najib did with whatever absolute power that he had compared to past, authority, past atrocities and past uh, villains or people who held positions of power in the past as well. Okay. Um, yeah, sure. So the premise of opening up is that you must prioritize relatability, believability, and people being able to relate. Given this context, would you actively deprioritize complex events from being taught? So I think there's always going to be a trade-off. So you won't actively be prioritized, but if the comparative was to choose between telling the story of Hitler compared to the social economics of Germany, we will prioritize the story of Hitler. I think that's very clear already. Okay, so I'll do two things now. Number one, how do we actually get children on the ground to be interested in the kinds of teachings of history? Number two, understanding the impacts of the kinds of individualism that existed in the past, do we, how do we move forward and tell these children the kinds of things that happened in the past, the very first place. But before that, Roshan did point out that we need to have a lot of these things, but he didn't want to concede that there needs to be some form of prioritization. If you don't want the emphasis of individual stories, but at the same time you don't want the emphasis of this, what do you really want? If there's no emphasis on a certain part of history, that means you're just teaching students a blanket policy of just random things that they can't even relate to. Yeah, you want to talk about maths? A lot of children don't really like maths and probably find it very boring. If that's the problem in status quo, you need to tell me your solution and tell me your stance on how you make that better, which I'll do right now. So the way in which you make history something that's interesting is to make it relatable and to make it something that people can understand. So if the children know that they are angry at Hitler for what he did to the Holocaust, if the children know that they are very proud that two Mahade did these certain things to develop their country, those are easier measures in which those children can understand and learn the kinds of things that they are learning, sit down watching anymore. So in that world, 
your children are able to digest the kind of things that your history classes are teaching them. And I think that's the better world for the children to live in, especially given the context of this debate. The second thing I'll say right now is that understanding the kinds of things that happened in the past, which way is it best to give these individuals the kinds of stories in the past? So in the past, there's always going to be a figure of power. There's always going to be a Napoleon. There's always going to be a Stalin or like Winston Churchill or whatever. There are always those people of power who control the majority of decisions that individuals make. So it's not as balanced as it is now. There's always absolute power to the majority of leaders in the past. Noticing that context, I think it's easier for us to give those explanations and story the children of the kind of things those people do did in their perspective or in the very writing in nature of that person. So I think this is more than just dates or like uh, autobiography. I think it's the kinds of human motivations that they have. Like why did Hitler want to raise an army after World War One, even if it was bad for Germany? Realizing that Hitler probably wanted more for himself or probably wanted more for his country is understanding the kinds of nuances and the kinds of things that individuals have in nature. And those are the kinds of things that are easier for children to understand because they can relate to that very fast because it's themselves as well. So it's always going to be something to do with emotions. I think that's important. That's because it can be easier to learn. So it fulfills your purpose of teaching them history. No more. The second thing we'll say is that the point in which you link a story back to an individual is the point in which that story is remembered better. So the reason why we know a lot of Black Lives Matter or the point in which there's a conversation about Black Lives Matter, Martin Luther King's name will always pop up. Malcolm X will pop up. The reason why this happens is because you're very well versed into that individual, or maybe not us, but probably students in the US or whatever. They are very well versed in that one individual aspect and the kinds of choices that that individual made. The reason why this is important is because you spearhead that story inside their head as well. So they will not know every single detail about Malcolm X or every single thing that Martin Luther King did, but it's easier for them to link back that story to the individual and the kind of choices the individual made. We also think that you can get a lot of the facts or historical things that happened in the society at that time by just looking back at the kind of choices that Martin Luther King made, by like looking at his speech and all the transcripts of his speeches, then you know the kinds of issues that happened and the kind of choices that that individual made to combat those issues. We also think, and this is where it transitions a bit to what Daphne said earlier on, is this is where you can draw nuances and parallels towards what's happening in status quo. And I think that fulfills the very purpose of teaching history, is to point out the kinds of imbalances or the kinds of atrocities that individuals in power do in right now. So the kinds of things that Najib does in power, the kinds of what and maybe scandals that people in power had over co like corporations who had a lot of power. I think if you compare that to historical facts, of other individuals in power for corporations in the past, it's easier for children to make or draw that alienation and thus understanding and becoming more informed of what's happening in society. We back to oppose. The arc of history is not determined by events that have taken place, but rather it is about how we interpreted these events. The interpretation is led by what we chose to record and what we didn't. We didn't record the massacre of Venice because we were too busy documenting the rise of Hitler within the SS. We didn't document the massacre in Ankara because Ataturk became the central focus of Turkish history. That is the problem that closing government seeks to solve. Here's the differentiation. Opening government spoke about the following things. They talked about smaller events and knowing all the details. I have one question. I don't think they explained why it's particularly important. So here's what the important is. In closing government, we're going to tell you how the process of recording history and of itself was skewed from the very beginning. We'll also tell you how the research that led to how we conceptualize the world today was also skewed. Here's why this is the most important thing within the debate. Knowing history is not just knowing, like I can know a lot of things that cannot be a benefit to it. Rather, it is about knowing how the events of the past shape the privileges that you currently have. Insofar as I can prove to you that the average individual now understands just how historical events impact their lives today, even if they were not white and they didn't benefit of slavery, that should be sufficient for me to win. So here's a couple of questions of response I have, firstly, to opening opposition. This is extension material as well. The first thing, what is the best version of formation of relatability? In opposition, we hear the following premise. 
If you have a particular identity, you can thus tie events to each other and then you can have people knowing about historical events. The problem with this is that relatability is stuck to a singular figure and their experiences become the main frame of how people relate to historical events. The reason as to why tons of young white Americans don't see themselves as benefiting off slavery is because they didn't have ancestors or they just were not like the people that owned slaves at that point in time. That's why the conceptions of history that happen in the world of opening opposition are highly problematic. You allow for people to absolve themselves of responsibility and just being accountable to these events because they're not like the individuals that committed them. That's why on a comparative, you may have relatability, but that relatability is skewed to make them feel like they're not guilty. The second thing, they spoke about the power manifestation between individuals. So um, Myanmar is committing a massacre. We will draw a parallel to Hitler. Like, I, I think that sentence in of itself explains everything that's wrong. Myanmar is not Germany and no one leading it. And Aung San Suu Kyi is not Hitler. That is the easiest metric of defending her like possible, right? Literally, all I have to do is like, she doesn't have a much of a good political party. She literally is a powerless president. Hitler wasn't. That's why you can actively suggest and say that these people were not linked. I just think it's a horrible way of attacking a genocidical individuals. The last thing, how do we spark interest better? So I think opening opposition is correct in pointing out that yes, people are interested in figures. That's great. But I think maybe we should figure that out because this is a value judgment debate. So in the world of closing government, like the new will just be people study history for the sake of studying it instead of looking at particular individuals. The reason as to why this is problematic is that you just try to link everyone together. One further happened in Germany, one was in the Middle East, you try to draw the parallels between the two, even when they aren't. The problem with this is that you don't have honest discussions on the circumstances that existed in both of these areas. Because you continually try to make them look like they're similar, despite the fact that they were intrinsically different, you remove the active nuances from all of those circumstances that allowed for this person to come to power. Power. That's why on these two levels, history is skewed in the world of opening opposition. My first question of another extension, why does history become better in our world? So first question that I have to answer, what did the emphasis do to research? So you have to understand that when people entered like writing research papers at Oxford to figure out how a particular event happened, it was entered with already a skewed mindset. You are entering it from a singular mindset or a singular viewpoint. Whether it was a general, whether it was anyone, I'm running out of historical figures to name, this was because these people were used as the focal point. This means all the conceptions and all of the events that actively happened were written in the perspective of this particular person, in the perspective of what this particular person was doing as well. What is the problem with this? Number one, it is skewed. This is to suggest not that you're taking like the opposition of them out of context, but rather you're not, you're ignoring all of the other voices that formulated what that particular person led to. But the second thing, you pin all of your research on a singular individual. This means a couple of things. When you are teaching them, you have to establish a cult of personality for this person. You either have to play up the victories that this individual have to make it interesting enough to teach, or you have to play down the atrocities that this individual committed. Here's why this is problematic. We never have honest discussions on our historical figures. Tungu Abraza was a horrible man by all counts, but we don't know that because we actively have to sell that heroic complex. Why is the comparative to singular events better? You can't play up or play down events. All of these stories in of itself, of all the survivors, individuals that they document would inherently contradict each other, I don't know. So anyone that is lying actively literally gets called out by the collective communities that they are born into. But the second thing, why do we need to focus on the smaller events? This is particularly important. The events of the past still impact the present. Whether it was the Gettysburg event or whether it was the convention of bringing the first slaves to America, all of these still radically impact individuals. But because at that particular point in time, historians were just obsessed on getting a memorandum on George Washington, interviewing him, we never saw or documented that these people were being brought here. What does this mean? Their ancestors still live in America. They are still poor, but we literally cannot prove it because we failed to document that struggle in of itself. We failed to actually analyze, we failed to photograph, we failed to memorize, we failed to document all of these things that could have proven that an atrocity happened for the sole reason being that we wanted to focus everything on a singular individual. So what does this mean? It means that individuals who are suffering now don't have a historical throwback to link their sufferings to. But the second thing is that we don't fully conceptualize history. So this means inherently 
all of the history that you have in the side of opening opposition, it might be relatable, but it's dismissive. It is skewed because the entire focal point of it in of itself was not to record the events, rather it was to create a narrative. At the end of my speech, here are three things I have proven. Here's why they were important. I proved that the entire mindset of entering research in of itself was skewed. Secondly, I explained how the smaller events in history were the most impactful and why they must be documented. History is unfortunately unkind, but it's not to those who don't remember, but it's to those we forgot. Thank you. Oh yeah, now I'm kept focused to let all of you know my preferred pronoun, a preference. <laughs> okay, uh, right, not, not yet start up. <laughs> this debate is about historical pedagogy. Right? So therefore, what's important in this debate is the continuous creation of material for historical discourse and for people to partake in said discourse. Closing opposition will enter this debate and contribute positive material in these two segments. Right, but uh, And therefore, I'll section my speech into several segments. First, I'm going to discuss the understanding of evil and which side best con or which side best contributed to a better understanding of evil. Secondly, I'm going to talk about the mass appeal of historical figures. And th uh, thirdly, I'm going to talk about the niche alternative narrative that government wants. Um, fourthly, I'm going to talk about why uh, why is it important that the alternative narrative is kept as a niche area of study. And lastly, I'm going to talk about the two stakeholders that I will that closing opposition uniquely identifies, which is firstly high schoolers, and secondly, the average consumer, which is the adult who is engaging in a lifelong learning process because he wants to learn history for the sake of personal benefit. Firstly, in terms of better understanding of evil, right? I tell you that a because it's a regress debate, retrospectively speaking, we achieve a better understanding of evil through psychoanalysis of evil people. Meaning that we realize that it's also the structures um, that contributed to the creation of individuals like Hitler, for example. And we realize that the nature of evil is a result of individuals abusing the loose structures of power that also existed in these empires. Meaning it was a destitute Germany post-World War I with, it, with the addition of Hitler's you know, corrupt personality that led to the Holocaust, right? Which also led or contributed to the general human, human understanding that anyone can be evil if the circumstances can lead the human to, you know, engaging in evil acts, right? I would posit as a response to Nabin's extension, two benefits to research via via using political figures, right? Firstly, it contributed it contributed to the nature versus nurture delineation in psychology. And secondly, it contributed to the creation of key studies on personality psychology, right? So this, as a whole, resulted in the creation of more nurturing nation states, for example, after understanding the nature of Hitler, because individuals could relate to how Hitler came to be, right? So this, it, this, this form of nurturing nature state, nation states that existed can uh, be explained in turning. So government became more nurturing towards the citizens, meaning like democracies became stronger, institutions were strengthened in numerous countries around the world, but externally as well in terms of diplomacy, where in, in the sense that better treaties were created, not screw over other nations, so less Hitlers were created as a result of screwing over other nations, right? Meaning or for example, or evidence by movement towards soft power, by like uh, powerhouses like China, for example, or the creation of the United Nations. This was only achieved through the historical understanding that it, it is the individuals that are, uh, it, it is the emphasis on individuals that can um, that can contribute a lot to the, 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 the engagement of evil, right? Next, what is the mass appeal of historical figures, right? Because opening opposition talked a lot about relatability and the emotional level or the emotional element that is associated with political figures and why it's easier as a result um, for individuals to learn history if it's emphasized on historical figures, right? Emphasis on figures and closing opposition at a more nuanced level looks like high school textbooks oh, naming chapters after figures. So like Caesar, Hannibal, Napoleon, the age of Napoleon or Gandhi or Churchill or whatever, right? It's not entire autobiographies 
uh, as quoted by o opening document, but it's books <laughs> that link the stories to the greater story of the empires, right? So they behave as entry points to the greater story. What are the unique effects of these entry points? Firstly, thought of personality. These figures have been romanticized by that generation and subsequent generations as well. Secondly, relatability, opening opposition explained already. I don't think there's many even more. But thirdly, and most importantly, they had quantifiable influence. Individuals like Napoleon, for example, or like Caesar, they ran autocracies, right? They had the most influence in the empire states that they built, right? But secondly, even if the even in democratic institutions where the power of leaders was uh, was diluted. We tell that, for example, in World War II, England, it took an extremely brave and exceptional individual like Churchill to do the things that he did in World War II to benefit or to fight for England in World War II. That's why these individuals are exceptional. Therefore, there should be greater emphasis because they serve as entry points. What is the niche alternative narrative that government wants to create? So like this drive, because like, History is literally the most boring subject, right? You don't like it. You want to make it more boring. How? Firstly, by emphasizing on societies as at large. You want to talk about political systems, social hierarchies, the economic activities of these societies. Right? Secondly, they want to talk about the structural, sociological analysis of these empires, right? How the sociological structures contributed to the rise and fall of these empires. This is more informative and, uh, and more holistic approach, but these things are already taught in tertiary institutions to degree and elective courses for those who are interested in history and for students who are made compulsory to study the subjects like TITAS, for example. Right? Why is it important that this, uh, that this is kept as a niche right. thing, right? Because they would have adopted a more sophisticated, because like university students adopt a more so sophisticated worldview because of the environment of universities, right? Through the creation of better critical thinking, for example, through like the interaction with professors, consumption of complex right. materials like journals that alter the fundamental nature of their logic and values, for example. But also they have evolved values like the university students. They're less compelled by grandeur and more compelled by nuanced analysis. The comparative on government side is that you have less figures, more about societies and structures in secondary school textbooks, for example. No, thank you. This reduces the appeal, meaning it reduces the interest of a child in engaging in extracurricular learning. What does this look like? This looks like a student being less interested in pursuing history degrees. This looks like students being less interested in having discussions with teachers after class. This looks like students being less interested in watching documentaries. And this is important because this behaves as a supply line to historical and political intellectuals that ensures the continuum of discourse, right? Next, let's talk about the average consumer. What is the average consumer going to do with historical information? It's not like they're going to vote or like they're going to like dislodge power structures or whatever, right? But I'm going to see how we do that. They'll have, they'll likely have, they'll, they'll likely have casual discussion with friends or engage in historical analysis through like private interests or hobby, right? So it's inconsequential aside for personal benefit. But let's talk about the more important stakeholder here: the nationalist individuals who take pride in national identity. Um, and, and have votes that influence political parties, for example, right? So like even if they become groupies of figures like George Washington or Tukwok Rahman, great, right? Because this pride will result in greater drive to protect the sovereignty and constitutions of the country, meaning they vote for parties that protect these things. But cults of personality are also often criticized by liberal intellectuals and social scientists, meaning through the emphasis on political figures, that's when you create a more morally gray perception towards individuals like Gandhi, Mother Teresa, and Churchill because they also committed atrocities. This is important because it creates precedence for future leaders and dislodge, effectively dislodge the structures of power and create the more accountable leaders, which is essential in preventing future atrocities. That is the link between emphasizing historical pedagogy on political figures compared to like making it boring and no one will be interested in it. I'm very proud to oppose. Here's what I'm going to do in my speech. I'm just first going to talk about whether or not we get interest of people to study history in the future, now, yeah. secondary school, whatever. Most of what uh, closing extensions are is just about more nuanced discussion about secondary schools. <laughs> Similarly, like the whole state, I'll deal with that anyway. Second, I'll talk about why currently the interpretation of history based on important specific historic figures created a modern day world which did not, that which does not acknowledge a lot of the struggles and privileges that people face or repercussions of history that we just cannot solve due to lack of data and lack of statistics. These are things that are not responded to by uh, from closing opposition. Okay, first, 
interest. And whether or not they get interest, the main line or main premise kept coming up from both sides of the opposition uh, of the opposition is firstly, in order for individuals to be uh, interested in a particular subject or an entry point, as closing opposition says, into history, is that there must be some form of identity that people can relate to. And this was like this was just like reused over and over again by both sides of the opening houses of the opposition bench. The problem or the thing about relatability is, is that on our side, when we talk about more like like general events, we talk about broader scopes, rather than just emphasis on a singular actor or a singular person, uh, analysis or documented history about every single person is a is a kind is a kind of history that creates more relatability for more individuals out there. There are a lot of individuals or cultures or minorities within his, history that was not recorded or not talked about. Why would that person be interested in Hitler? But in our circumstances, we talk about events. When we talk about the average person and the trends that these people go through, for example, World War Two, the merchant, the guy who sell cabbages back in World War Two, the like bubonic plague, everyone there got like you know dying here and there, the families, those histories or a relative that that person might be related to, this is when relatable identity becomes strongest, that's when we have better interest within history. But sec secondly, even if we don't get that form of interest and we don't get that form of relate relatability, I think a good documentation of history that is not simplified is one that we prefer. Why is this important? Because we think simplification of history often leads to strong structural oppressions or generalizations and stereotypes and discriminations yeah, yeah. of today. Why is this true? For example, there has been long-lasting like lack of discussion or analysis or survey towards women. Women workers, for example, back during the second wave of uh, second wave of feminism. For example, um, let me think. What other examples? Not a lot of examples. Slaves, for example, right? <laughs> if you don't know, last time the slaves, when they after 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 slavery ended. When they all became maids and all became those workers, right? They weren't, they weren't allowed to use the same toilet as a white person. These are circumstances that happen, right? They go undocumented, not talked about, not researched about. There's the reason why sexism occurs today is because there's not a lot of research and surveys done to done to discuss problems that these people face, grassroots reasons of why these individuals face certain discriminations right now. The lack of those documentation makes it hard for people, like for example, feminist advocates to argue on behalf of their movement or talk about structural reasons about why they need help right now. But it's hard for them because there's not a lot of surveys done back in the past because it's because it, we focus on one part rather than the other. Similarly, in history, if we focus on one individual rather than a lot of other parties, we are unable to carry on forward and get a generalization that is not no problem with these individuals that are actually facing repercussions. Now, there's no problem with these individuals and everything's all jolly good and fine. The third thing about interest is that if it is true, if it is true that the, that university is the only platform for where you want to enter more niche discussions about history, the problem is that interest will be missing because you have already introduced history to be to be uh, to be portrayed in the perspective of a historical single individual. So if they enter history, most students would expect to learn history based on individual stories or individual portrayals of how the world should be. But when they add the more niche discussions, this is when they get um like they don't. This is when they get less interested. They get like a dark, they, they get turned off by this by these instances of history in university. So you don't really get improvements of niche characteristics or specifics within history that you want to talk about in closing house. Second issue, why the interpretation of history focusing on important figures harm the formation of modern day culture and struggles? I think Navi talked a lot about this, and this is where I do with the psychoanalysis extension coming up from closing opposition. So closing opposition argues that we get to understand the cups of personality or what it is to be evil. The, the problem with this is that what you are creating what you are creating on terms of the cups of personality you're creating is an exaggerated version of that cup, those cups of personality. Yeah, in yeah. order to keep people interested, you often have to up, like, like show that the atrocities are like very grand, they kill a lot of people. All these kind of things are things that you have to exaggerate in order to, um, in order to make it interesting. So the problem is that one person committing, committing so many like extreme acts of evil, it's hard for you to put a like or tie back a lot of blank like tie back to a lot of individuals or leaders that you talk about are evil to that single to that single person. Similarly to what Nabin said, 
individuals often have the ability to absolve themselves of being related to that epitome of evil, the Hitler, the exaggerated version of what evil should be. And a lot of people are able to run away from those problems just saying that I am not as extreme as that person. I am not as extreme as those circumstances, those individuals, and those scenarios. Those are circumstances, that's, that's, and that's extremely problematic because it's harder to link or to draw parallels to those individuals. You let them run away from a lot of causes. Sure. Uh, so I don't think it's that you are Hitler, but I think it's that there's a possibility of you becoming a person like him because there are circumstantial reasons as to how they became that and there are some similar circumstances that exist in status quo. Knowing so much about a certain person means that there's more like you are understanding that this other random person status quo can be done now. Yes, knowing more about these individuals would to some extent talk about the processes of how this person become people, the trends to about all of this. But the problem is once you create or immortalize this person as an epitome of evil, that no one else can be as, as more evil than that person, then it's very hard for people to draw links that I am like Hitler. The comparative on our side is a, a more like like most like like more representative discussion of history about events and subjects is more is more able for individuals to identify trends for the average person that might have benefited of slavery for the average person and their actions for the average white man that can't run away and say I am not like that rich white person back in those days or like my ancestors I am those person I am the person who has benefited of slavery because the discussion on our side is more focused towards every individual the specific contexts towards this individual and it's easier to apply to them and we can. Get, like, it's harder for them to run away from all this. Like, this lastly, right? You think statistics is important? A lot of the policies that we talked about right now are based out of historical context, and we don't think that doc, like all these undocumented researches of stats of historical events back in the day makes it hard for us to push for policies, affirmative action policies, because we just don't care or don't know enough about it. So first of all, on the point on interest, right? We, we feel that interest need uh, will be developed if you were to talk about the individual themselves instead of the whole event which is happening. Because know that if you were to know uh, if, if an individual is that famous or known for a particular event or for resolving a huge um, a, a huge problem at a particular time. It means that this individual had contributed something into the formation or into resolving the problem, right? And in doing so, you need to know the approach taken or what, uh, or yeah, what are the thoughts or what are the approach taken for him to fit or for, for that particular individual, uh, individual to solve the problem that arise at that time, right? Instead of talking about a, a gay guy in that event which happens, or instead of talking about a niche problem. Uh, in, instead of highlighting on that, just because you want to cater to the, uh, just so that you want development in your society today, right? Because we feel that the development or the discourse of events or a discourse of the development for society will occur anyway because we follow the norms. And when we have, when the, uh, as time goes, the norm changes. And then when you are accept, when, when you started to accept things, that is when you will. Uh, that that is when you will realize. Sit down. That is when you will begin to realize, and that's when you will accept more things in life, right? So some people have no interest at all in history. So even if you were to 
you know, highlight the event that occurs so that they would build their interest. They wouldn't like anything to do with the past because they can't really, they, they, they can't really, they, they don't like to know something which happened in the past. Instead, they're focused. So in this event, we still feel that despite what, uh, despite what you do, you won't uh, build up the interest for uh, this okay. kind of individual, okay. right? In our side, sit down. In under our side, we, uh, under our side, somehow we would feel that people would know when when this education has been taught to you and when it's made compulsory for you to learn it, that is when people have to take the initiative to learn. People have to graduate, have to pass by knowing this history and by knowing the events that happened, as, uh, that, by, by knowing what happened as a whole, right? Sit down. So when you discuss about a uh, particular political figure, right? You will have a uh, cult of personality criticized by uh, liberals, intellectual, and society, and uh, social uh, scientists, right? So you will have, <coughs> uh, yeah, you will have a morally gray per uh, perception. You will have a morally gray perception to to uh, towards these figures, uh, and this is important because a you will dislodge the structures of power and B, you create more accountable uh, leaders in the future, right? Before that opening, yes. What's the point of learning of history if a child only learns a watered down version, a story of one person, it leads to the hero victim complex, it leads to them not understanding their culture, their history, and their development, and having bad conversations in the future. So, what's the point of learning history other than the interest that you spark? There are, many, there are many other points in which they learn history to know the history as a whole and don't have to know what you're talking about. Thank you. So, uh, first I'll start up on what uh, the okay the points discussed by opening house, right? Opening government. So, opening government told us about uh, younger generation and why they need to know the history, right? So, we feel that these younger generation, as they grow, uh, as they grow, they wouldn't have time for them to focus on what they should know in uh, what they should know and what they have to know since early uh, or since young because at the time in which they enter uh, schools or at the time in which they uh, pursue for their ter tertiary education is when they have to equip themselves with all the knowledge of their country because as they progress they wouldn't have time uh, they, they wouldn't prioritize for them to know if, uh, about the history but for you to build nationalism, for you to build uh, love for your country, is when you know what happened. And for you to know what approach taken by us, especially individual, in an event for them to, to resolve a problem is important because that is when you would you you will try to approach uh, you will try to you will try to think or you'll try to uh, resolve whatever from a crisis that you are facing. Say for example, many years back when Mahade took approach to uh, to lend money to pay uh, Malaysia's debt by lending from Japan just because they have a lower interest rate, right? So that approach was uh, tried again by him just because you have this thought, you have these thoughts and you have this type of uh, the, these thoughts and that is when you spark the that that is when you spark the knowledge thinking that people the uh, individual the or the leaders today can even do the same right and next uh, the next point on individual so you uh, uh government yeah government talk to us about why individual they link back to the story to the individual and what the decision the individual take as I said and. Uh, sorry, sit down. I'm not thinking anymore. So, what then we told you in this debate today, right? So, first of all, we told you about a uh, better understanding of evil, in which we prefer a world in which you do a psychoanalysis of the results of in individuals abusing the system, which you can create more nurturing uh, nature of the state. Next, we talked to you about mass appeal of historical figure, uh, about books or entry port, in which by having uh, an entry point is when the approach is taken, the approach taken by the leader, which is the best, makes it an entry point for people to think or even react the same. Third, we talk to you about the niche narrative 
and uh, fourth on alternative narrative, and finally on the stakeholders. With that, we proper a post. Yeah, yeah. You record the live stream. Live stream. If you if you need me to take it down, let me know.